Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about pirates. Mm hmm. And specifically freebooting. Uh, you were supposed to say I or R or <laughs> something, right, you know, piratical. Our <laughs> meaty. I don't do pirate speak. We don't have a lot of catch up or follow up, but one thing I will say is that you may have noticed that this is again a week late. There's been three weeks since our last episode. Sorry about that. Life is just really beating us over the head right now. We were kidnapped by pirates. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> sure. Let's go with that. Um, an update in case any of you are concerned. Um, my broken wrist continues to heal. I'm now out of a cast, newly out of a cast and into a brace and doing physio and have some hope of having a right hand that works again in the next six months. See, if only you ended up with a hook for a hand, it'd be perfect for this episode. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have such good, optimistic well wishes <laughs> so close to me. Anyway, so we will get forward. Today, we are going to talk about a video that you put out a couple of years ago now. Yeah, November 2015. Okay, a few years ago. About freebooting and mm -hmm. pirates and words for piracy and copyright infringement. Yeah. But before we get to that, then, we need to introduce our cocktails. Because this time, unlike sometimes when looking for a cocktail, it's been really hard to find one. This time, the problem was there were way too many pirate-related cocktails. There are a lot of rum-based pirate cocktails. <laughs> so we decided to go old school. Yeah. And I'd, I'm going to let you say what they're called, Mark, because you've had such <laughs> joy pronouncing this word since I told you about the drink. Indeed. It's called a bumbo. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> Which always makes me think of that uh, baby chair. I know that we had. <laughs> <laughs> for those who don't know, it's it's basically like it's a chair for a baby, but it's basically like a foam socket in which you insert the baby's bum into and it keeps them upright yeah it's a like molded <laughs> plastic slash foam thing for babies who are too small to just sit, sit up. upright yet mm -hmm. yeah that you can sit them in and they can sit and and play and it was called a bumbo <laughs> um probably for different reasons than this drink <laughs> but i don't know that's up to you to tell well, me about so uh, let me tell you about the different. drink itself it is originally it was apparently rum water sugar and nutmeg or <laughs> sometimes other spices the more modern version of it is rum, lemon juice, a little bit of grenadine, and nutmeg. Mm -hmm. To make ours, it's a dark rum, and I didn't actually have any dark rum yet because it's not Mai Tai season, so we didn't have uh, very <laughs> many rums in. So I went to the store and I was looking and there were two rums on the shelf that claimed both of them to be the original English Navy rum. So I got a bottle of both because I'm very indecisive at the liquor store. And we've made our cocktails with the two, one one each with one of them. So the one I have is with Lamb's Old Navy Rum. And you've got... Pussers. Yeah. Navy Navy Grog or Navy, Navy rum. rum. Yeah. So shall we try them and we'll mm. see if there's a difference? Ooh. I like it though. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's pretty. I mean, it's not very sweet because the grenadine is only a half a teaspoon. Right. So if you're thinking when listening that this is like a sweet tiki drink, it's really not. No. What it has that's tiki-ish is the nutmeg. Mm -hmm. A lot of nutmeg. A quarter teaspoon of nutmeg in each drink. So, mm -hmm. It's tasty. Okay, let me try yours and see what the rum's like. Because the rum is the main flavor. So, Oh, they're quite different. They are. This one has less sharpness or something mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, it's more the, the lamb. Mm -hmm. Lamb's is smoother and darker. It has yeah. more of the molasses in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pastors is um, quite like this is rum. Mm. <laughs> and it doesn't have that rounded. It's not quite as sweet, I think, too. No. Okay, I like mine better. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. I think I like it better too, but... <laughs> we could mingle them. Mm. <laughs> but they're both good drinks. Mm. So good, because I didn't... That's not a drink I knew before. No. Did you look up the name? Because I know you were enjoying the name. Yes. Well, first of all, a little historical detail about this. Mm -hmm. It's the sort of equivalent to the Navy's grog, mm -hmm. which was basically rum and, and lime. Yeah. To protect the sailors from scurvy. Now, for short haul sailors and pirates and so forth, they didn't need the lime because they would often be at port and would have lots of 
fresh fruit and vegetables in their diet. They wouldn't be out That's, at sea for long trips. And especially in the Caribbean, where in they the Caribbean. ate a lot of fruit yeah. as a regular thing. Exactly. So they originally made it, therefore, without the lime. It was just rum, water, and sugar, uh, sugar yeah. and the nutmeg. In terms of the name, we don't know exactly where it comes from. The best the Oxford English Dictionary can do is it says, compare Italian bombo, a child's word for drink. Okay. So, so it is a kid's word. It is a kid's word. <laughs> I mean, it does sound like one. Mm -hmm. Now, exactly how that Italian word right. is connected to bumbo is probably Unclear. not clear, mm -hmm. um, but that's the, that's the closest connection that anyone's been able to suggest. And the earliest citation for the word is in 1748 in a book called Roderick Random, Roderick Random's Adventures, or the, oh. sorry, The Adventures of Roderick Random. Nice. <laughs> written by Tobias Smollett, a oh yeah, yeah, an important of writer of such adventure stories, adventure yeah. stories with pirates and so forth. Um, and in particular, uh, this book is based on Smollett's own actual experience as a naval surgeon's mate uh, in the British Navy. Hmm, okay, um, especially during, according to the Wikipedia entry, especially uh, during the Battle of Cartagena de Indias in 1741. So the actual citation is a, a table well stored with bumbo and wine. Good. Well, so it is actually, I, I found it on a, you know, list of six cocktails to go with Pirates mm -hmm. of the Caribbean or something, or no, to go with Talk Like a Pirate Day, right? which we'll come back to perhaps. So I had no idea how authentic, it said it was authentic, but it definitely you know, is. it was just a random mm -hmm. cocktail page. So <laughs> it definitely is authentic. Good. So, well, and it certainly tastes, it's not a fancy cocktail. No, no. The only thing that's fancy about it is the spice. Yeah. Okay, well then, with that done, it should go quite well, I think, with our discussion topic for today. So why don't you introduce the video? Yeah, so the, the video is actually called Freebooting, mm -hmm. and it's about freebooting in, I, I guess, both the sort of original sense of the word, freebooting is another word for piracy, an old word for piracy, mm -hmm. but it has become, more recently, an internet word yeah. for the re-uploading of YouTube videos. So downloading a, a video from uh, someone's YouTube channel and re-uploading it either on YouTube or very often on Facebook. And therefore the-, the Well, we'll cover it. This is covered this in is covered the video. In the video. Yeah. yeah, but just for those who don't haven't heard the term perhaps. Yeah. And it forms actually part of a trilogy of videos that I made on, on intellectual property rights. Yeah. Intellectual property laws. Mm-hmm. The first one, we already did the uh, podcast about bug, mm -hmm. in which we talked about patents. Mm -hmm. uh, so freebooting today will cover copyright. Mm -hmm. And in the future, you will hear another podcast on the word linoleum, which will talk about trademark. Mm -hmm. Still not our easiest sell, that video. <laughs> linoleum, linoleum is a great word, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think that's probably enough. Shall yeah. we listen to the video? Freebooting, which once referred to maritime piracy, has recently started to be used for a particular type of online piracy, or more precisely, copyright infringement, the unauthorized rehosting of video, in particular, on Facebook. This can lead to loss of income from ad revenue for the creator of the content. In theory, such content is protected by copyright, but as often in the past, technology and common practice has outstripped the laws and systems to protect creators. This word freebooting, or rather this new sense of an old word, was coined by YouTuber Brady Harron in early 2014 in his discussion of the problem with CGP Grey on their podcast Hello Internet. Brady had been calling it stealing, which Grey found inaccurate in reference to copyright infringement. Wanting a term with more emotional impact than infringement, Brady scanned through synonyms for piracy and settled on freebooting. Unlike many coinages, this one is taking hold of the wider world, probably because it fills a real need for a new term for a new problem. It was quickly picked up by other YouTubers, notably Destin Sandlin, whose video and interview on the subject helped spread it into mainstream media. There is in fact considerable debate about using terms like piracy and theft for intellectual property, not actual physical objects, but the term pirate, in the delightfully formed expressions word pirate and land pirate, has been applied to the unauthorized copiers of texts since the beginning of the 17th century, well before the advent of modern copyright law. Indeed, it's printed text that we have to thank for copyright law, which was later extended to include many other types of creative expression, like YouTube videos. 
Until the 15th century all texts had to be individually and laboriously copied by hand, but just like today a technological advance was the driver of change, with the printing press, introduced in Europe by Johannes Gutenberg and in England by William Caxton, allowing mass production of books. The first problem this new technology raised was not ownership of intellectual property, but censorship of dangerous ideas, in particular the ongoing tussle between Protestantism and Catholicism over the 16th and 17th centuries. In England the Stationers' Company, essentially a private syndicate of printers, was granted a monopoly on all printing in 1557 by Catholic Queen Mary, whose often violent suppression of Protestants earned her the nickname Bloody Mary. In exchange for the financial benefits of a monopoly it became the company's responsibility to censor any politically or religiously dangerous or revolutionary texts. By the end of the 17th century this monopoly ended with the lessening of religious tensions, and soon many were clamouring for new legislation. One of those advocating for a new law was the writer Daniel Defoe who, though not the first to use the noun pirate for those unauthorised copiers, is the first on record to use the verb to pirate in this new sense. Finally, the Copyright Act of 1709, commonly known as the Statute of Anne, named after the current monarch Queen Anne, was passed, the first copyright legislation granting legal protection to the authors, rather than the printers, for 14 years with the possibility for extension. The specifics of copyright laws, such as the term of protection, changed over the years, but the legislation has influenced similar laws around the world right up to this day. Now freebooting and to freeboot are actually backformed from freebooter which is first recorded in English in 1570, with the other words first appearing about 20 years later. That word is actually a calc or loan translation from the Dutch word freibouter, one of many nautical words English has borrowed from Dutch. A calc, by the way, is when a word or phrase is translated from one language to another with each element literally rendered word by word into the new language. The first element, free, has cognates with roughly the same meaning in all the Germanic languages, and goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root that means to love, which also gives us the words friend, Friday, named after the Germanic goddess Frigg or Freya, the wife of Odin, and afraid, which means literally out of peace. The word goes from meaning to love to its modern sense because it was used to refer to your family member whom you love, as opposed to the slaves and servants also in your household who aren't free. The second element is not related to boot meaning footwear, but to booty meaning spoils or plunder. This comes into English in the 15th century through French, from a Germanic root meaning booty or exchange, though it may have been influenced by yet another unrelated boot word, boot in the sense advantage or profit, ultimately related to the words better and best. So it's not surprising that we associate both the words freebooting and booty with pirates. Interestingly the Dutch word freibouter has come into English twice. Besides the direct calc of freebooter, the word comes in more mangled forms through French and Spanish to eventually give us the word filibuster. Originally filibuster also meant pirate or adventurer, but in the middle of the 19th century in American English it came to refer specifically to adventurers from the US engaging in, at least unofficially, unauthorized military activities in Central America and the Caribbean, in an attempt to foment rebellion and overthrow the governments and from that it came to mean other similar acts of unauthorized and unofficial warfare in foreign states. Finally it was used for yet another kind of rebellious act, in political legislatures when a long speech is given as a delaying tactic obstructing progress. Of course there are many words for pirate in English. The word pirate itself comes through Latin from a Greek root that means to attempt or attack. The Proto-Indo-European root behind this also gives us words such as peril, experience, and fear and may be related to a group of Indo-European roots which lead to a great many words in English, including privateer, a term for private sailors that were commissioned by their governments to attack and capture merchant ships from enemy nations. Similar in formation to privateer is buccaneer, whose root comes from the Caribbean Tupi language word mukem, meaning a frame for smoking meat. The word comes to English from French, being originally applied to the displaced French hunters in the Spanish-controlled West Indies. Evidently they not only engaged in piracy against their Spanish enemies, but also enjoyed a good barbecue, because the word buccaneer mirrors the word barbecue, which comes from barbacoa, the Haitian word for the same contraption. And finally there's corsair, from the root that gives us the word course, from the idea of going on a course or expedition for booty, but more on that one later. Maritime piracy has no doubt existed ever since trade by ship started. For example it was a big enough problem in the ancient Mediterranean that it affected Athenian and Roman politics, and perhaps the most famous medieval maritime raiders are the Vikings. But when we think of the word pirate today it brings to mind peg-legged sea captains with eye patches and parrots on their shoulders. 
This cliché comes to us from the golden age of piracy, a time of increased piracy from the 1650s to 1730s, when European powers were establishing colonies and global trade with ventures such as the East India Company, and is often particularly centered on the Caribbean. This made its way into literature, where events became romanticized, leading to our modern popular conception of the pirate. The literary history of the pirate goes back a long way too. The ancient Greek novel, forerunner of the medieval romance, told fanciful tales of young lovers travelling through exotic lands encountering mishaps such as shipwrecks, imprisonments, and trials of their fidelity, and often featured pirates as antagonists. But pirates in popular fiction really took off in the 18th century with novels of travel and adventure such as those of Daniel Defoe. Remember him? Defoe is best known for Robinson Crusoe, which tells of many nautical adventures, including pirates, shipwrecks, mutineers, and cannibals. He was a bit of a pirate fanatic and included them in a number of his novels, and it's been argued that Defoe wrote the very influential book, A General History of Pirates, under the pseudonym Captain Charles Johnson. This semi-fictionalized biography of many notorious real-life pirates, such as Blackbeard and Calico Jack, popularized their exploits and introduced many of the now-standard pirate tropes such as Buried Treasure and the Jolly Roger, becoming a kind of source book for pirate literature. The etymology of the name for that skull and crossbones pirate flag, by the way, is uncertain, but most likely it's an alternate form of the expression Old Roger, a euphemistic term for the devil similar to Old Nick. By the beginning of the 19th century, piracy had also become the subject of romantic poetry in Lord Byron's poem The Corsair, which told the tale of Conrad, who rebels against society and turns to piracy. Conrad is an example of the Byronic hero, a broodingly attractive, paradoxically noble but rebellious anti-hero, and a literary representation of Byron's own persona. Byron, famously described as mad, bad, and dangerous to know, was very much in the mold of the bad boy rocker of more recent times, and the Byronic hero has since been a very influential trope in popular culture. Think of contemporary teenage vampires, and of course, the modern romanticized pirate. Byron himself tried to live up to his literary persona and joined the Greek War of Independence from the Ottoman Empire, an action, I suppose, a bit like a filibuster. But the most famous pirate book, of course, is Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, which established Long John Silver in the popular imagination as the quintessential pirate and popularized the clichés of missing limbs, parrots, and pirate maps where X marked the spot. The character of Long John Silver was inspired by Stevenson's pal, poet and editor William Ernest Henley, now most known for his poem Invictus, whose leg amputated below the knee and powerful presence made a suitably piratical impression on his friend. Henley may also have inspired another quintessential and influential pirate character, Captain Hook, in J. M. Barrie's Peter Pan. Henley's daughter Margaret, who would refer to Barry lispingly as Fwendy Wendy, inspired the name and character of Wendy Darling in Barry's famous play and novel. Of course, one of the popular modern pirate clichés is the famous R filled pirate accent, now celebrated annually on International Talk Like a Pirate Day. This is actually an exaggerated West Country accent from the southwest of England, which includes areas such as Cornwall and Somerset. This was the native accent of the actor Robert Newton, who famously realized the character of Long John Silver in the 1950 Disney adaptation of Treasure Island. Though there may have been some previous historical and fictional basis to this pirate cliché, the real-life Blackbeard was from that area, and the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, The Pirates of Penzance, Another influential example of pirate pop culture, which ironically enough was the focus of a battle over copyright and pirated productions of the play in the US, was set there. It's really in Newton's over-the-top performance that this accent cliché crystallized. In fact, Disney has produced several of the most influential pirate movies, Treasure Island, Peter Pan, and of course, the Pirates of the Caribbean series. And funnily enough, Disney is also one of the strongest lobbyists for extending and increasing copyright protection, and is a fierce opponent of piracy. Actually, Brady's podcast partner, CGP Grey, has made a video on this very topic, highlighting the paradox that what was intended to promote creativity is starting to stifle it. But over time, these Disney films have become increasingly family-friendly, and we see the genuinely dangerous, murderous pirates, which were preserved more in Newton's portrayal, become tamed, more friendly, and even cartoonish. Robert Newton himself was a bit of a hard-drinking, rebellious Byronic hero type, and was apparently a role model for other bad boy types, including 60s rocker Keith Moon, drummer of The Who, also known for his dissolute and rebellious behavior. Of course, sometimes the influence goes the other way, as when the other famously hard-living 60s rocker named Keith, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones, influenced actor Johnny Depp's portrayal of the pirate Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. 
Jack's sometimes ally, sometimes antagonist in the films, Captain Barbosa, is obviously influenced by Robert Newton, complete with broad West Country accent. While we're on the subject of 60s musicians, through the coincidence of his name, the basis of occasional jokes, Davy Jones of the Monkees is also tied into this story. In pirate terms, Davy Jones is the devil or spirit of the sea, and in nautical slang, to go to Davy Jones's locker is to go to the bottom of the sea, or die. Though there have been numerous folk etymologies proposed for the term, the most probable is that it refers to Saint David, a frequent exclamation of Welsh sailors, and the biblical Jonah, who was swallowed by a whale. The expression, by the way, seems to be first mentioned in print by our friend Daniel Defoe. But getting back to our original pirate word, freebooting, one of the reasons Brady Harron picked this particular pirate synonym was that it sounded kind of computery, as in booting up a computer, when a bit of code is used to load and initiate the operating system and anything else the computer hardware needs to function. Booting in this sense is a shortening of bootstrapping from the expression to pull oneself up by one's bootstraps, meaning to do a seemingly impossible task or to better oneself by unaided effort, usually meaning a self-made man who has figuratively lifted himself up by the little loops on the back of his own boots. On the subject of computing, by the way, you may know Ada Lovelace, whose work on algorithms for Babbage's analytic engine earn her the credit as the world's first computer programmer. Lovelace was the daughter of the premier Byronic hero, Lord Byron himself. But going back to pirate connections, there's bootstrap Bill Turner from the Pirates of the Caribbean films who was sent to Davy Jones's locker by being thrown overboard with a cannonball tied to his bootstraps. Pulled not up, but down by his bootstraps. This metaphor also gives its name to the bootstrap paradox, also known as a causal loop, a kind of temporal paradox in which a future event is the cause of a past event which eventually causes that future event like a time traveler going back in time to give himself the time machine that he will later use to go back in time. The event has no origin and is thus a paradox. The term for this paradox comes from sci-fi author Robert Heinlein's short story By His Bootstraps, in which the protagonist, Bob Wilson, is literally a self-made man, as his future self travels back in time, bringing him to the future and setting himself up as a despot in control of a time machine. The bootstrap paradox was more recently referenced in the Doctor Who episode Before the Flood. Google it. Though he didn't invent the time travel story, sci-fi author H.G. Wells certainly popularized it with his novel The Time Machine, which was dedicated to its editor and publisher, pirate character inspiring William Ernest Henley. Wells, of course, was influenced by fellow 19th century sci-fi author Jules Verne, whose novel Around the World in 80 Days, when adapted to film in 1956, starred our other pirate cliché inspiration, Robert Newton, as Inspector Fix. For his part, Verne was inspired to write his own adventure stories after reading, as a child, The Adventures of the Outlandish Hero Baron Munchausen, written by Rudolf Eric Rasp. Baron Munchausen lends his name to a concept very similar to the idea of pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps. In one scene in the book, Munchausen pulls himself and his horse out of a mire by pulling on his own ponytail. This is the reference behind the Munchausen number, a natural number the sum of whose digits each raised to the power of itself is equal to itself. And it turns out that Brady Harron, our coiner of freebooting, made a video about the Munchausen number on his YouTube channel number file. Now as I said, most newly coined words don't catch on. Perhaps the fact that Brady chose a word with so many different connections to the thing it describes is part of the reason this one is having such success. So, there are a few points from that I wanted to go into a little more detail, stuff I didn't have time to include mm -hmm. originally. First of all, some observations about the fact that copyright comes from religion and censorship. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to think that we have the Protestant uh, Reformation indirectly responsible for copyright. And basically, as a result of all that religious and political censorship that was going on earlier, mm -hmm. earlier on. Now, as it happens, Queen Mary didn't remain on the throne long after granting that publishing monopoly to the Stationers Company, but the censorship continued for nearly 150 years. Mm -hmm. In the 17th century, John Milton, who was a strong supporter of the Puritan-led government of Oliver Cromwell during those interregnum years, yeah. he argued strongly against what was called pre-publication censorship. So basically, there would be a committee who would decide before the work comes to press whether or not it was allowed to be published. Right. 
And basically he said that works should be allowed to be published and then see if they're causing harm or not and only suppress things. So only ban books. Only ban books. Don't censor them. Don't pre-censor them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> I don't know whether to consider that enlightened or just <laughs> different. He wrote this in a sort of tract called Areopagitica. And his among his arguments for this is that he says that censorship is a really Catholic thing to do, right? Because <laughs> so, of So don't do it because it'll, it's popish. Yes, don't do it because... <laughs> and there's nothing that gets Puritans angrier than comparing them to Catholics. So... <laughs> So it wasn't really until later on during the uh, after the uh, Glorious Revolution when William and Mary jointly took the throne uh, and therefore the uh, chance of a Catholic monarch coming back to the throne was basically eliminated, eliminated mm -hmm. that censorship therefore also became a non-issue because that was the real reason behind censorship in the first place. Right. But speaking of Milton, his most famous work, Paradise Lost was a big inspiration, one of the main inspirations for that Byronic hero character. Right, Satan. The, Satan. And the the romantic poets all want, they all like looked up to Satan because he's rebellious <laughs> and, uh, well, it, you can't technically look up to, to Satan. Satan. You can only <laughs> yeah, look, look down, down to, to Satan. Satan. <laughs> yes. No, but they thought, they thought he was no, great because he was, you know, yeah. ambitious and, you know, never give up kind of mm -hmm. uh, character. And so they kind of reinterpreted that character in a sort of heroic kind mm -hmm. of way. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the Byronic hero, really. And basically, Satan is the ultimate bad boy, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> now, some more etymological details that I didn't get around to including. Mm -hmm. Some more about the word free and related words that mean free. Right. So the word element free that I mentioned is perhaps surprisingly, uh, we see this, this perhaps surprising shift from love mm -hmm. to free because of that stuff about slavery, right? Yeah. Well, Latin had another word that kind of parallels this in a way, the Latin word liber, mm -hmm. right? Which means free. It's mm -hmm. a base sense of it means free, but it could be used to mean children in the plural. Libri, li, uh, liberi. liberi. Yes. yes. Not libri. Not libri. That's, that's books. books. <laughs> this is a source of great confoundment <laughs> to uh, first year of Latin students yes. everywhere. Libri, books, liberi, liberi, free people or children. children. It's yeah. very upsetting. Yes. <laughs> So that, that word, uh, mm -hmm. liber, comes from a Proto-Indo-European root that probably meant something like belonging to the people. Hmm. Now, I mentioned briefly that goddess who gets the, the, the day Friday named yes. after her, either Frigg or Freya. Mm -hmm. Well, Frigg in the Old Norse form and Freya in the Old English form. That name is similar to and sometimes confused with another goddess, Freya. Right. You can see why. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, say, usually people, when they say Friday, they say it's named after Freya. Freya, in, yeah. in Like if you see popular etymologies yeah. of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Freya was a fertility goddess and a goddess of love and beauty. Mm -hmm. Hence the, I guess, the connection with Venus. Right. Which is why it's Freya's day in the equivalent to Venus's day, Vendredi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, it suggested that, in fact, these two goddesses may have originally been the same goddess anyways. Right. So it's not so much a confusion as... <laughs> right. Exactly. And then they sort of became distinguished as two separate goddesses in Old Norse mythology, later Old Norse mythology or something like that. Okay. But in any case, that name Freya comes from the Proto-Germanic root that means lady, which leads to modern German Frau. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, but this Germanic root goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, pair, mm -hmm. meaning forward. Was this one of the pair it's, roots that you listed in that little yes, group? Yes. Yeah. So this is pair one, okay. which gives us the word privateer and probably lies behind the various other pair words. So okay. they probably all come from pair one. So pair three is the tri-risk word that gives us pirate. Okay. <laughs> So they're probably all, all connected. connected, but it's, 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 it's because it's proto, a proto language. People are not completely sure yeah. how all of them come together. And it's super productive, these roots. So there's like tons of words that come from them. And so disentangling all that is obviously kind of tricky. But in any case, in a funny sort of way, the goddesses Frigg or Freya are brought together in our discussion of freebooting and piracy. Right. As for the, those other 
pair roots, which probably descend from pair one, uh, meaning forward. They give us a number of other relevant words here that I didn't mention, including print, the printing okay, press, yes, and press, also printing press. Or like press ganging. <laughs> or press ganging. Yeah, that's which true. Is, yeah. Or impressing, which is uh, what the British Navy often did with pirates and also just random people in yep. ports mm -hmm. in the time of the pi of piracy and before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the word fear. I think you mentioned no, that in the I video. mentioned... Fear being connected to one of the pair roots. Was it fear or afraid? Because they're oh, not related. I don't know. <laughs> I think the word that I mentioned was afraid. Fear and, fra uh, and afraid are not connected. They're actually... Uh, <laughs> I think I need diagrams. I think we need to go back to a video because I need yeah. diagrams for this stuff. So afraid I mentioned in the video comes from the pre root related to free, the word free. Okay. Right. Which right. is not connected to, to pair, pair root, which gives us fear. Okay. Surprisingly, you think they'd, you'd think they'd be afraid, but they are not. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you can be afeared as afeared. well as afraid. afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you could be once. I don't think anyone says that anymore. <laughs> I need another drink. <laughs> <laughs> now, the etymology of booty that I talked about. Booty in its sort of more common modern sense probably derived from the word bottom, Right. Booty yeah. as in bottom or body. We don't know exactly if booty comes from bottom or body. But, or both sort or of. Or both yeah. sort of together. Or maybe influenced by butt. Mm -hmm. But in any case, it's unrelated to booty meaning treasure. Right. And, but I, Though I, I giggle every single time I talk about booty, booty in yes. Rome, you know, Roman civ <laughs> class. And I'm like, and then the commanders brought, lot, brought back lots of booty to share with their... <laughs> They're soldiers, and then I titter to myself, and my class is like, really? Like, grow up. <laughs> they rarely find it as funny as I do. <laughs> well, I bring this up for another reason, the other booty word, because <laughs> it's hard to resist making the reference to Sir Mix Mixalot's song, Baby mm -hmm. Got Back, with the mm -hmm. line, I like big butts, and I cannot lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because this song is at the center of a famous copyright infringement oh, yes, right. controversy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tenuous, tenuous, but I'll, I'll grant it. I'll allow it. <laughs> the TV show Glee used the song in 2013, and they appear to have, in, in addition to using the song, mm -hmm. uh, they appear to have lifted uncredited the arrangement, original melody, and backing tracks of someone else's ver version, Jonathan like Coulton. Jonathan Colton's, yeah, which was the real, uh, I mean, that was, became the, using a song, I mean, there's ways of clearing that, yeah. those permissions, and obviously Glee used lots of songs, that was the whole point of it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, it was the arrangement, it, it was, was the using arrangement. the arrangement and the... And, the, and his backing tracks. Mm -hmm. So the TV network's lawyers claim that no law was broken since Colton's version was a cover and therefore not protected by copyright. This is apparently a thing. Okay. I, yeah, the, the, so copyright, the song, in music, copyright in music is so complicated. I know, yeah, Because yeah. there's, yeah, all of these things, right? There's the actual song, there's the arrangement, mm -hmm. there's the performance, there's the recording, there's the word, like all of those are separate items that yeah. all have to be covered in some element. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the song is obviously under copyright and they paid whatever. They got their permission, yeah. They got their permission and paid whatever they had to pay for using it. But the legal position uh, of the, the uh, TV network anyways was that the, the, the arrangement couldn't be copyrighted. Now, if it had been an original Jonathan Colton song, he could have copyrighted the arrangement. Yeah. Oh, that's scummy. <laughs> I mean, even if that's true, like that's a that's an awful loophole. Right? But I'd love to hear from legal experts out there as to whether or not it may, how true that is. It may well be true. That's, but that's the, the line that they played. Yeah. And they won, didn't they? I think so. Yeah. yeah. It may well be the legal position. It, they may have been right, but it's still that's a mm. that's a scummy whole loophole then. But even worse than that is they also said that he should have just been happy for the exposure. Oh, yeah, I know. I, I did hear about that. <laughs> Jonathan Colton is a in certain quarters, a very well-known sort of nerd musician right. and yeah and so i've heard that discussion i know it just really literally insult to injury mm -hmm. and that's often the the response to youtube freebooting yeah. is the, you know they say oh but i'm getting you exposure i'm yeah. we're uh, we're getting you more people knowing you yeah yeah, yeah. so and not cool see the freebooting thing we didn't get into of course in the video but the problem comes from different people in different ways yeah and it's frustrating because there's multiple sort of intense behind it. There's people like newspapers re-uploading videos onto their news websites, right. uh, credited, but not 
but hosting them themselves. Yeah. And that's a kind of freebooting. Yeah. And that's really frustrating because they're an institution and they clearly just want content and they want the clicks and they want the ad money themselves. Yeah. And they're straightforwardly depriving the creator. Then there's individuals who will post things to Facebook and think that they're helping the creator mm -hmm. sometimes genuinely don't sort of realize, but are being just as harmful in a way. Yeah. But the intent can be very different mm -hmm. there. And so the, as a creator, you're sort of stuck in this position of, first of all, having to track it all down. And second, sort of trying to, you don't want to alienate the fans who are doing it because they love you, whereas you do absolutely want to prosecute with full force of the law yeah. the idiot newspapers who are fully aware of what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. So it's frustrating on a lot of different ways. <laughs> yeah, so don't do it, people. Yeah. Always link. And I've always, it, it is strange to me that people do it at, sort of accidentally in a way because downloading from YouTube is not actually terribly simple. No, you it's, have to go to extra lengths to yeah, do it. Yeah, it's very easy to link to YouTube, mm -hmm. to embed or to link. So to do anything more than that really does feel odd. And the, and a major part of the, when freebooting made it into the popular consciousness was when that was being discussed as how Facebook was not in any way seeming to police it. Yeah. Right. They didn't yeah. seem, they seemed very happy to let people do it because it kept them on kept the site. Them on the site. And it helped Facebook and mm -hmm. they did not seem at all. So, you know, not that now it seems like a quaint problem to have with Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Kick them when they're down. There you go. Getting back to etymologies, though. Mm -hmm. So Davy Jones etymology, mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned briefly, and uh, you know that there are a number of other folk etymologies. Well, not necessarily folk etymology, but suggestions, possible yeah. etymologies. Though I will say none of them have much evidence to support it. Some have tried to identify an actual historical David Jones that it might refer to. Right. Probably a pirate himself. I guess would be the the obvious place to look. Mm -hmm. And also one intriguing suggestion of a pub owner who would lock up drunken or drugged sailors in the ale locker in his pub, and then they would be press ganged, as ah, you right, said, right. into service on pirate ships. Mm. Interesting. There was a comment, and now I'm not going to be able to find it, but there was a comment on the video because we were just looking at mm -hmm. it. And I'm sorry to the person who left the comment because... I should credit you, but I don't have time to figure it out now. But um, <laughs> somebody suggested that if it is St. David, yes, that Jones might just be the use of the very common Welsh name, surname, Jones. Jones. Yeah, you know, if it's going to be St. Yeah. David, who would he be if he's Davy? He's going to be Davy Jones. Jones. That's so true. that it could come from yeah. that. And I thought that could, was could, interesting. That be, yeah. If it, you know, if the St. David one is a fairly mm -hmm. plausible uh, connection yeah. that the Jones, and then might be reinforced by the Jonah connection, the Jonah but, connection. but it's not Jonah. No. Like, you know, Jonah and Jones are not the same no, words. So. No. Yeah. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> well, another suggestion is that Davy comes from the word duppy, which is a <laughs> Jamaican Creole word, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately from an African origin, uh, meaning ghost or spirit. Ah, and then that would make sense of the fact that it's where people go when they're dead. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. In any case, the earliest citation for the term that's listed in the OED is, again, Tobias Smollett, mm. The Adventure of Peregrine Pickle, published in 1751, which uh, clearly identifies the figure as a spirit of the deep, according to sailor mythology. Okay, right. But our old friend Daniel Defoe earlier used the term more ambiguously as a threat in the book, uh, The Four Years Voyages of Captain George Roberts. From... Just as a sort of general naval threat, like yeah. maritime threat yeah. or something. Without making it clear exactly what it meant. Right. So that was from 1726. Now, the Jolly Roger etymology that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there are a number of other suggestions for the term Jolly Roger. The, one suggestion is that it comes from French, mm -hmm. Jolly Rouge. Oh, yeah. Meaning pretty red or something like that. Yeah. But as the OED says, the flag is generally black, not red, mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't. There doesn't seem to be any any evidence for that French phrase being used for this. Right. So, so why would it? Why would why right. would that work? But perhaps uh, the most unlikely suggestion that I came across is that the term came from Eastern pirates with the expression Ali Raja. Hmm. Which is, and you'll find this one uh, sometimes circulated around the internet, and they always translate Ali Raja as king of the sea, which 
I can't make sense of myself. Right. I mean, the the word Raja comes from Sanskrit and is it, it actually translated as king is, is king. fine. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And it uh, comes from Sanskrit and it appears in a number of languages in mm-hmm. the uh, Indian, East South yeah. Asia area. Yeah. So king, I get that. But the Ali part, I can't find anything in any language. Any, the only mean? language that I found is, and I don't think this is related at all, it's a language from the Philippines, uh, Limos Kalinga. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ali means king, not C. Right, but then what would Raja? What would Raja mean? So I don't know. <laughs> right. I mean, the other suggestion is that Ali Raja was the name of a Tamil pirate. In which case, which that, that makes a little more sense. Perfectly possible. Mm-hmm. The, but speaking of Tamil, the as far as I can tell, the word for sea or ocean in Tamil is katal, nothing to do with Ali. So I'm a little confused by that. If anyone has any more knowledge about that, <laughs> I'd like to know. But it's, again, it's not, not I don't think it's true. <laughs> likely. Right. Yeah. But what is clear is that uh, the jolly nicely reflects the apparent grinning skull on the flag. Yeah. It's kind of a grim humor, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it no, makes it's, sense. Uh, once, wherever it comes from, one can see why it's stuck. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Now, Robert Newton. Mm-hmm. Uh, an interesting little footnote on him. Uh, early in his career, Newton appeared in a production of Alicia Ramsey's biographical play, Byron. No. He didn't, <laughs> as Byron? No. No, not as Byron himself. He played uh, Byron's publisher, John Murray, who notoriously burned uh, Byron's memoirs for fear that it was so scandalous that it would ruin his reputation. Like, so yeah. even more scandalous than the stuff people already knew about <laughs> Byron. It would I ruin guess. Byron's reputation. You yes. ruin Byron's reputation. Yes. Yeah. Which one would have thought at that point when he died could not be <laughs> ruined, ruined further. further. Yeah. No. Yeah. But again, another act of censorship or pre publication <laughs> censorship, <laughs> I suppose. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> As for Newton establishing the cliché pirate accent, there may have been a precursor to the stereotypical R anyways, mm-hmm. though I haven't been able to uh, verify this, but uh, it has I've, I've seen it claimed that apparently actor Lionel Barrymore, who played the role of Billy Bones in an in an earlier 1934 adaptation of Treasure Island, says R. Okay. But what I've been able to, the clips that I've been able to find of that, he basically just sounds you know, American, certainly not West Country. Hmm. If he says R, that may, may be true, but I haven't seen the whole film. Right. So right. I've only been able to find clips. Right. So anyways, if anyone knows that film and can verify this or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a big ask. <laughs> so talking about films and the popular conception of pirates and well, not only films, but fiction, literature. Mm -hmm. One influential author that I didn't mention, uh, who is really central to um, establishing the the popular pirate, is uh, Raphael Sabatini, who wrote a number of famous pirate novels and other adventure stories in the early 20th century, including The Seahawk in 1915 uh, and Captain Blood in 1922. Both of those, I think, have been made into films. Probably. Captain Blood, I've heard of. I don't know if I've heard of the other. So, Sabatini's treatment of the the pirate figure is more of a swashbuckling, patriotic Mm. type figure, often portrayed on screen by the likes of Errol Flynn, that sort of figure. And this is also part of our modern- the rogue with heart of gold stuff. Yeah. 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 So so that's another piece of the puzzle there. Mm. Now, I mentioned briefly the uh, the Pirates of Penzance copyright battle, so to give the full details of that. <laughs> Can we? It's complicated. <laughs> well, I'll, no, okay, not the full details. <laughs> a little more detail. <laughs> what, what is it? Uh, let me explain. No, it's too complicated. Let me sum up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. She also has a nice piratey <laughs> yes, connection. Yes, Dread that Pirate quotation. Roberts. That's right. Yeah. So at the time, U.S. copyright law didn't protect work of foreign authors. Right. Not cool 19th century American law. <laughs> <laughs> so it only protected American, American, American writers, writers in America, yes. right? Yeah. Um, so there were numerous unauthorized productions of Gilbert and Sullivan's previous operetta, HMS Pinafore, and they got no money for this, obviously. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of ticked off about this. And so therefore the Pirates of Penzance, which was already probably a bit of a jibe at these pirated productions, mm-hmm. um, was premiered in the U.S., rather than in England, in order to uh, beat the infringers to the profits. Right. So that they, they put got it the on initial, themselves. Yeah, they put, put it on themselves, themselves in, in the US, got the profits mm-hmm. from the initial, you know, excitement right. about it. And, right, right. Yeah. So that's that's basically but, the story. Right. And 
finally, a bit more on uh, Baron Munchausen. Mm -hmm. This is quite an interesting story. <laughs> um, so the story is about Baron Munchausen, who was a real figure, actually, the name Baron Munchausen right. refers to a real life figure, but the sort of fictionalized figure um, who at run point, uh, he rides a cannonball, by the way. So uh, I guess that's a bit of a connection to bootstrap Bill Turner. <laughs> and his, yeah. his story also has something to tell us about copyright and authorship. Mm. Um, so the author, Rudolf Eric Rasp, who I mentioned, wrote the Baron, uh, Munchausen. Baron Munchausen stories. He was also known for his scientific writing and was actually a bit of a shady, disreputable character himself involved in with a bit of mining fraud. <laughs> ah, who hasn't done a bit of mining fraud, really? <laughs> well, since he based his most famous fictional character on a real-life person, the German aristocrat uh, Hieronymus Karl Friedrich von Munchausen, <laughs> yes. I think that's his full name, who is indeed, in real life, was known for telling tall tales. Okay. So that's why he inspired the fictional character. Um, so Rasp, therefore, kept the uh, his authorship a secret fearing some kind of libel suit or something. Was Munchausen still alive when he yeah. wrote these? Okay, yeah. right. <laughs> then he um, probably should, yeah. And in fact, initially, the character's name when printed in the books was only printed as M-H-S-N. Ah, uh, yes. This, you see that all the time in like Jane Austen and stuff. And, yeah. and it's very weird in Jane Austen because I'm sure it's not referring to real people, so I don't know why things are left <laughs> out. It's very confusing to me. But anyway, yeah, and it's a very, very poor job of disguising who you're referring yeah, yeah, to yeah. usually too. Well, I mean, clearly wanted people to know, but want to maintain pl uh, plausible, plausible deniability. deniability. Yeah. <laughs> but when it, when the name was finally revealed as actually Munchausen, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the real life Munchausen uh, was not at all pleased uh, and tried to have the book suppressed. Mm -hmm. So again, censorship, censorship and so forth. Rasp himself, in fact, lost control over the copyright of the book. Because he hadn't put his name to it. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that must be the reason. Yeah. And so it was then reprinted by other publishers with various embellishments and added material and stuff that he didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> and so this all seems like a good object lesson for our modern loose attitudes to copyright and authorship. <laughs> well, or it's a mashup story. Really. A mashup story, <laughs> yeah, I suppose. But in a final twist, in the 2012 German television adaptation of the Baron Munchausen stories, the actor Jan Josef uh, Liefster played the role, uh, and his performance seems to have inspired Johnny Depp's Captain Jack Sparrow as well. Been one of the one of the inspirations for Johnny Depp. <laughs> Johnny Depp's Captain Jack. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So just as a final little thing, I decided to look up some etymologies of other piratey words and phrases that have become <laughs> sort of popular. Right. Swashbuckling, I guess, is... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned that mentioned. In a couple times, yeah. So swash, it means originally on its own to dash or strike something violently. It's an imitative word, a kind of onomatopoeia word. Right? Okay, yeah. So swash makes the yeah. sound. Um, so to hit something. And buckler is a type of uh, small round shield. Mm -hmm. Comes from the Latin uh, word bucula. Originally, uh, that referred to um, part of a helmet, the beaver or the sort of face face guard on a Roman helmet. Yeah. Yeah. The nose guard or whatever, I guess. Or is it the bits that hang down the That's side? The cheek. Yeah. yeah maybe I think the, cheeks. the, the yeah, cheek. cheek. I think parts, it's the yeah. cheek parts. I'm really bad at armor. <laughs> But by medieval Latin, the word was also used to refer to the boss of a shield. Right. Um, and that's how it came to B mean, be, mean buckler, a yeah. small shield. So bucula is, is, I guess, a diminutive of buca, which means cheek. Right. Yeah. So right. that's the little, shield. That must be the cheek bit. Yeah. Must be the cheek bit. Yeah. Now, shiver me timbers. <laughs> we all say this. It's actually kind of a mock oath. I don't think it's something that they ever really said. Right. It's a fictional, it's a fictional thing. thing. So it doesn't really mean anything. But I suppose shiver can also mean break something into many small pieces. So shiver me timbers is like, you know, break up the ship or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, avast is a real word. Avast means stop. So, if, you know, if a pirate says avast, he means, you know, stop Just in your... Yeah, okay. Stop in place. It comes from a Dutch phrase, houd fast. To hold fast. Hold fast. Okay. Yeah. Parley. Mm -hmm. To to have a, a discussion or a uh, conference or whatever. Yeah, it's a, like a treaty discussion or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. Have a, come to terms or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. That obviously comes from French, 
parlay. Mm-hmm. Parlay comes from parabolare. Oh, yes. I, we I mentioned this in a previous else, video. And yeah, yeah it, it surprised me then, to say the least. So parabolare means to speak in parables. Right, and it's from Greek. It's from Greek. Yeah. Parabole in Greek means a comparison, but literally means basically uh, to throw beside. So para, beside, and balane, to throw. Mm -hmm. So a parable, when you make a comparison between two things, you throw one thing beside another thing. It's bizarre to me that the absolutely primary word for meaning to speak in French ends up coming from that. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that, that that word makes it into French is not necessarily massively complicated. I mean, it makes it into Latin, it makes it into French, sure. But for something that means such a very specific kind of speech. And they had several other Latin words for There's lots speak. of words for speech, yeah. And, and none of the basic Latin words for speech are connected to no. that at all. And then none of those came into it. And that parler became, I mean, that's, that is how you say to speak in French. Yeah. Any other word is a, has a more restricted meaning. It's weird. <laughs> so weird. Okay. And finally, pieces of eight. Why are they pieces of eight? <laughs> right. Well, they refer to an actual Spanish coin that was commonly used at the time that was worth eight, I guess it's pronounced reals, which is royals mm-hmm. because it had a picture of the king, the on, king it. on it and also had the number eight stamped on the side. Okay. So this was a currency that pirates so the Use. real, so a co- one coin worth eight reals. Yes. Okay. So that's if. The, but if you have any other favorite pirate expressions or words that yeah that you're we curious didn't mention, about, let us know and we can maybe get the answer for you if there is an answer. Yeah, or if it's not an obvious one like walk the plank, which yeah. is you know walking in a plank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. I don't want to take up too much more time, but since you did mention ancient pirates Mm. in the video, and there is so much to say about ancient pirates. I mean, this could be like a seven-part series on pirates. Well, and there's so much to say about pirates in In all parts of the world. At all times. (laughs) At all times. Exactly. Right? Like, we could go on and on and on about pirates. There's Surely there's a podcast out there that's just about just pirates. About pirates. And yeah, if there probably. isn't, there ought to be. Yeah. I know there's a history of maritime. Oh, I'm forgetting what it is. I'll put a link in the show notes. There's a history of um, a maritime history podcast, right. essentially. And of course, Sam McLean is has just restarted his academic podcast, which right. is going to have some history of maritime stuff. Um, so I can put links to both of those. But I don't know of one that's specific to pirates, but I'm sure there is one. Anyway. Lots and lots and lots of stuff to say about pirates in the ancient world. So I won't Mm -hmm. try and say it all, but I will say a few things. So first of all, our first mention of pirates comes from Homer. So it's right there there in the Odyssey. And in fact, in in at least one Homeric hymn, well, in fact, multiple Homeric hymns mention pirates. And so Odysseus, so there are pirates all the way through the Odyssey. Odysseus disguises himself as various people and tells stories. And half the time he says he was rescued by, you know, he was kidnapped by pirates. And in others, he says he was a pirate. So, you know, he just, it's an explanation for what you're doing if you're out there in the sea and you're a stranger and you arrive. It's one of the things you should do. And in fact, coming home from Troy, he and his men, one of their first things they do on the way home is raid along the coast right. and essentially are just pirates. Right. There's, nothing to distinguish them. They're not raiding enemies. Mm -hmm. They're just raiding people People. who happen to not be them. And so they act like pirates. But there's this formulaic reading that uh, turns up in Odyssey 3, 71 to 74, and again in Book 9, and then is also in the Homeric Hymn to Apollo. So, you know, it really is formulaic. It's the same, almost the same words in every instance. Mm -hmm. And it's the sort of thing a stra- somebody says to a stranger arriving on their shores. And it gives us a sense of what the idea of a pirate would be. Right. So I'm going to read uh, Emily Wilson's translation of it here. In book three, when Telemachus is uh, visiting Nestor, and he arrives and Pallas Athena walks him in and sits down and, as is important with hospitality nobody asks him who he is right right until he's been fed and washed and every and everyone's had a feast and then Nestor turns to him and says now that our guests are satisfied with food time now to talk to them and ask them questions strangers who are you where did you sail from are you on business or just scouting around like pirates on the sea who risk their lives to ravage foreign homes and it's that part strangers who are you where did you sail from that is repeated it's formulaic Mm -hmm. it's repeated in book nine and in the homericam and variants of it are elsewhere too so those are the sort of that's what you might be doing you might be on business which would essentially mean you are merchant Mm. or you're a pirate right 
And the word there is that leisteres word that I asked you to look up. Right. So if you want to tell me what that Greek word comes from. So the root, the Greek root for it is leia, mm -hmm. which means booty or spoils. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a Proto-Indo-European root lao, which means to acquire as booty or to enjoy something. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the use of it. Right. Okay. In that sense. And the only main cognate, at least in English, that we would know of, mm -hmm. uh, comes from Latin, in fact. It's Latin lucrum, which we get as lucre right. in English. So gain, lucre, profit. Which yeah. is the only way you ever say it yeah, in English. Yeah. <laughs> There's no such thing as clean lucre clean, no. or just lucre. It's yeah. only filthy lucre. Yeah. 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 So ill-gotten profit, yeah, profit or gain or whatever. Yeah. Cool. It really doesn't... It's interesting. It's, it's used to mean pirate or it's translated as pirate. But in fact, it can mean on land as well, as far as I can tell. Like, it just means a plunderer, somebody who robs other people right. with violence. But for the Greeks, that most often happened by sea because there wasn't a lot of overland travel. Hmm. Overland travel wasn't easy. So it tends to, you know, it, it must mean pirate when you're addressing somebody who just arrived by sea. Right. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense to use it. So, but it's, imp I think, interesting to note that there isn't, in fact, and this is true of Latin as well, there isn't really, other than pirate itself, pirata. Mm -hmm. There's multiple other words that are used in Latin, like praedones and stuff like that, praedo, praedones, that can be used on land or on sea. Right. It only means pirate because of context. Right. And it's often paired, in fact, with a word, another word, similar word that just means on land. Hmm. So, you know, the, the act isn't what we might call a brigand, if we use that word anymore. Right. Um, brigands on land, pirates by sea. It's, the act is the same whether it's by land or by sea. Right. We think of pirates as very distinct. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, they probably did have like a def different culture, just like anything maritime has a different culture than yeah. landlubbers. But for the Greeks and the Romans, it's really all the same thing. Outside of cities, outside of protected communities, you're at risk of being attacked by people who are not under, you know, civilized codes. Mm. basically. And that can be traveling by land or traveling by sea. So pirates, you know, Odysseus is a pirate, essentially is a pirate, acts like a pirate, and then also pretends to be a pirate a lot. And there are pirates all through the Odyssey. Then there's also pirates in myth, the two most famous pirate myths. Mm. So, you know, it shows how far it goes back are Di Dionysus and the pirates and Arian and the pirates. So the Dionysus and the Pirates turns up in the Homeric Hymn to Dionysus first, but it's a very, very popular story and hmm. it's repeated again and again and again. And the story basically goes that he's walking on the seashore, looking in the guise of a young man. This is early in his travels, uh, looking very pretty. And he gets kidnapped by Tyrrhenian pirates or pirates from somewhere. And they assume he's well-born and they want to ransom him. Mm -hmm. And he comes on the boat and the helmsman looks at him and says, oh, I don't think so. I think he must be a god. You, you stop this. Don't do this. And everyone else laughs at him. And then Dionysus proceeds to transform the ship into vines and trees and the <laughs> oars turn into tree branches and wine starts to pour down the shore, mm -hmm. down the middle of the boat. And then Dionysus himself appears as a... In the original hymn, he appears as a lion in the foredeck mm -hmm. and then as a bear on the in midships, both at the same time, because he's Dionysus, he can do that. And and the pirates are like, ah, what's going on? And then he causes, they get so frightened that they jump into the sea where he turns them into dolphins. Ah. But he spares the helmsman because the helmsman recognized him. And right. so he goes, takes him to land. And this is one of his first sort of miracles that he performs because the story of Dionysus is of him coming back to Greece and having to prove his divinity over and over uh, and over again. So okay. there's this whole long series of different myths that are all about people not recognizing him as divine and then him right. showing that he is. So that's one very famous story. The other one is... In, it's interesting because it seems to be a very folktale story, the other one, but also has dolphins. <laughs> and so it's Arian is this famous musician. He's a lyre player and he's probably the son of Poseidon, but he's also a priest of Apollo or loved by Apollo because, of course, Apollo loves lyre players. And he's kidnapped by pirates. The stories vary in how he is kidnapped, but he's kidnapped by pirates. And he they said they're going to kill him because he says he has no money for them. And he says, well, let me play one last, last hymn to Apollo before I die. And he plays a hymn to Apollo. And the music is so beautiful that it brings dolphins around the boat. And then he jumps overboard and he's rescued by dolphins and brought to land. 
in this link to Dionysus and many later writers see this link and they're like the dolphins who used to be pirates are then turned against the pirates and rescue the person who was kidnapped by the pirates. But those are two pirate stories. And they just, they show the basic assumption that if you are traveling, you are at risk. Right. So the Mediterranean had always been filled with pirates and pirates in the ancient world is a kind of interesting concept, much like the era of maybe the golden age of piracy, but also the privateer age. Right. What is a pirate except someone who has a boat who attacks you? Yeah. So there were many pirate kingdoms. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you talk about a pirate kingdom, you're already thinking, wait, is this actually pirates or are they just at war? Mm -hmm. So the Mediterranean is filled with this sort of, but no, there must have been, there were clearly also pirates who were just individual boats filled with people who were ready to take a chance and get what they could, right? So that certainly existed. But you also have like whole peoples who are associated with piracy, Hmm. but we don't hear that from them. Right. We hear that from the people who claim to have swept the seas clear of piracy Hmm. or who have claimed that they had to go to war against a country because that country was pirates. Right. Right. So it becomes this element of um, a very important element of kind of, self-positioning as empire and stuff. Mm. So you have the Athenians clearing the Sea of Pirates. You have Rhodes, which establishes very important maritime empire in the Hellenistic period, Mm. um, clearing the Sea of Pirates, but also being accused of piracy by others. Mm. Um, You have the Illyrian pirates. There were kingdoms there that were accused of being pirates by the Greeks and by the Romans. The uh, Cilician pirates. So there's this ongoing idea of pirates. And one of the things that happens, especially, so it happens again and again in the Greek and Hellenistic period, but I want to just turn to the Roman period because of some famous stories associated with it. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that, how it like affected Athenian and and Roman politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Roman politics is particularly, well, the Athenians interesting too, but interesting to me, the Roman stuff. In the late Republic, in the sort of first century BCE, there was a lot of positioning of Rome, you know, it it had to defend or expand explain its imperialism Hmm. in various ways. And one of the ways it did so was by positioning various of its opponents as either pirates themselves or those who gave harbor, literally, Hmm. to pirates, Hmm. allowed pirate bases to be in their territory. And there's some several famous sort of elements of this. So, for instance, there's a famous law about the pirates, though that terminology has been questioned, that around 100 BCE that was sort of sent to various kingdoms all around the Eastern Mediterranean, Eastern and and Southern Mediterranean, saying, if you do not root out the pirates in your territories and cease providing bases for the pirates, we will consider you pirates. Essentially, a slightly more fancy terminology than that. But basically, you're with us or you're against us. (laughs) And I will come back to that phrase. Um, Positioning Rome as being, because they were interfering with these kingdoms, Mm. But positioning that interference as being on the basis of the common good of all of the Mediterranean, that right. Rome was going to clear the seas of pirates and was working to protect all of civilized peoples mm. against the uncivilized peoples who were the pirates. Mm-hmm. And therefore, anyone who did not help them mm. was positioning themselves as uncivilized right. and against the common good of all people. So, you know, it, it became a really important part of this sort of positioning of why why Rome had the right to interfere with other states. Mm. Pirates become this touchstone that come, they come back to again and again. And then two very famous Romans were involved in very famous pirate situations. Mm-hmm. So one of them is Julius Caesar. Right. And there's a famous story of Caesar and the pirates. And I read a very interesting article about this story. The story is well known. Suetonius and Plutarch both tell it. Mm. Other people do as well. There's an article called Caesar and the Pirates, or How to Make and Break an Ancient Life by Josiah Osgood from 2010. I'll put a link that does a very good job of discussing the historiography of this story. I won't get into all of those details because that's beyond our need here. Mm. I'll tell the story and then I'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. And the story is that Caesar, when traveling to Crete in uh, as a fairly young man, when he was quite uh, just starting out on his political career, was captured by pirates and was ransomed, held for ransom. Mm -hmm. So just standard sort of thing. And he was, you know, 
all alone except for his, I think, his barber and two servants or something like that. You know, poor, poor man. Having sent all, the, so he sent all the rest of his companions off to raise the ransom, and he mm-hmm. went sent them to some of the eastern properties to raise the ransom of fifty talents, which was of um, silver, which was a lot. The part of the story that then is, you know, always told and everybody loves yeah. is he. He read books and he diced and gambled with the pirates and he just told them repeatedly, I'm going to come back and kill you all. You know that. I'm going to come back and kill you all. And they laughed at him and said, yeah, whatever. So they came back with the talents. He was ransomed. He went off. He raised a fleet. He went and asked for the governor, local governor to help him and didn't, the governor refused to. So he raised a fleet on his own, went back, found the pirates and had them all crucified. So, of course, you can see why this makes it into the biography later, right? right? Yeah. As like showing the kind of person Caesar was going to become right. and his early life. One of the things that shows, though, is the, the, the other part of that is how everybody, even Caesar, could be prey to the pirates at that point, hmm. right? So this is in the first half of the first century BCE. Probably around the 70s, there's a lot of problems with the chronology of the two story versions we have. One of the important points that this article points out, though, is how do we know anything about this? Right. The way we know it, it's clear that he was captured by pirates. Like that story is not going to just be made up. But all the details of what he said to the pirates, the only way any of his biographers could know that is if Julius Caesar himself told that story. Right. So he didn't write this up in his own... No, it's not in any of the works that we have. However, this author of this article suggests that there's a very good chance he may have told the story in one or more of the political speeches or court speeches he made early on. And so he says, you know, why would he? Why would he have told this story in the 70s? Or like, what would have been the reason for telling this story and and, and making it part of his own Hmm. story early on? Because he's not the Julius Caesar of legend yet. This is not like oh, it shows the kind of man I'm going to become, is, doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense retroactively. It right. makes sense why it's in the later biographers and right. why they make a big deal and it becomes more and more embellished. But why would he tell it? So he talks about how the issue of piracy was a big deal at that point in Rome and he was positioning himself as like somebody who could take swift action against the pirates, who was an expert on the idea of pirates. He's, he's really trying to talk about how pirates were a really important political thing at the right. time. And in connection with that, the other famous pirate story is there were other people being kidnapped at the time. Mm. So around this same time, people were being snatched from like the Appian Way outside mm. of Rome and kidnapped a Roman consul, or the daughter of a Roman consul, you know, so it was really getting close to home, literally. And so soon after that, Pompey was granted, uh, Pompey the Great was granted a special commission to clear the Sea of Pirates. And it was a special command right. um, over the entire Mediterranean, which was something that never happened before. And in fact, Julius Caesar is the only person we know of, other than I think Cicero, who spoke in favor of it, like who, who spoke for this. And this article suggests that that's because he was the guy who was the expert on oh, pirates. pirates. Right. Okay. So, you know, he's this. It's all sort of supposition, but it was mm. very interesting. Is this at all connected to the story of Julius Caesar being unhappy with the amount he was being yes. ransomed for? Yes. He also, that's another element of the story that we have is that he was mad that they only asked 50 talents yeah. for him. He and didn't he think paid, that was good enough. He paid more because he thought he should be worth more or something? I think in one of the versions of the yeah. story, yeah. There's a couple of there's sort of more bare bones versions and more elaborated stories. Yeah. yeah. And then he went back and got it all back from them yes. when he killed them. Yeah. So, yeah, so all of those things are probably a little bit of the, you know, just shows us what kind of man he was right. element. Yeah, so, I mean, everybody loves the story of Caesar and the pirates, but it is interesting to think about what that tells us about how pirates were being used politically at the time. Right. And, you know, he positioned himself as someone who rid the seas of this particular menace for the local communities who were not who were the client kingdoms, you mm-hmm. know, in that area. But so Pompey got this special command and through a very well-coordinated series of attacks basically did clear the sea of pirates, in part by offering very generous amnesty to anybody who turned themselves in and resettling them in different places, Mm -hmm. thereby gaining a large client base for himself and finishing very, very quickly so that he was able to take on another even more wealthy command. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, um, and we, we have evidence that pirates returned to the seas soon after. Right. But he did seem to have done some good. But it was an important step on his rise Political, to power, yeah. too. So it, we just see that pirates are like a, an, an important element of, of Roman policymaking at the time. And politics, ironically, 
his son after he died, mm -hmm. you know, fighting against Caesar or in the aftermath of fighting against Caesar, his son Sextus Pompey continued the fight against Caesar for a couple of years and was always called, um, it was, he was the leader of the pirate fleet. Hmm. So he put together, a, so he waged a naval war with freed and runaway slaves mm -hmm. and pirates. Now, how much they were pirates, I mean, they were people fighting a war. Right. But Caesar and others who spoke on his behalf and our sources always called them pirates. Right. So, but that's clearly part of sort of this idea that those who are fighting against you are associated with pirates. And this other article that I read with, by this guy called D'Souza argues that, in fact, the Romans were very influential in setting up this idea of the pirate, like mm. constructing what we even think of as pirates and what pirates became mm. as this, you know, as the figure that they have been ever since. Rome took the idea of piracy and fashioned it into a flexible, pejorative label, which they used for political purposes. Roman campaigns against maritime enemies were presented as the suppression of piracy because that su suited contemporary political needs, especially when the Roman aristocracy wanted to convince reluctant allies that they should fight with or for the Roman cause. Mm. D'Souza also argues that this politically inspired image took root in literary accounts because it suited a view of Roman history and of the Roman world that envisaged Rome as the suppressor of piracy and guarantor of maritime security for the civilized Mediterranean world. And so it sets the pirate, unlike in the Odyssey, where somebody could be a respectable king of Ithaca, but also a pirate right. against other people who weren't his own people, this idea of the pirate as removed from all civilized rules mm. as outside the law. So not only are do they act outside the law, but they also deserve no protection of the law. Right. Right? So that's an important thing. Like you think about that, it's in the Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, hang them without trial, do whatever you want. You can do anything to a pirate because they've abdicated their role in civilized society. Right. They're outside of it. They're not an enemy. So there's no rules of war when right. you fight a pirate. They've given up on those protections. So the distinction between pirate and enemy, D'Souza argues, is solidified in the Rome, late Republic in Rome. And soon after, Augustus does, you know, once he basically has control of the entire Mediterranean, he's much more able to remove the bases of such people. And there really aren't any enemies. And pirates don't disappear entirely, but the prob we hear very little about the pirate problem again mm -hmm. until much, much later. But he feels that this is really happening in the late first century BC. Piracy was an evil that afflicted the civilized world, and pirates were outlaws whom the Romans and those who shared their political and moral values should suppress for the good of all mankind. And the other thing is pirates were, you know, had already been constructed in the more romantic element in the Greek novels right. and the Greek um, plays of the Hellenistic period as people who, you know, kidnap our her heroes and her heroines. Yeah. But, you know, that this this is the construction. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. I think the D'Souza article, I saw some other articles that took issue with some of his construction of pirates. So it's part of an ongoing debate about the role mm -hmm. of piracy in, in Rome. But I it was convincing to me anyway. Mm -hmm. And the last element then I want to come back to is there is a, long, a, a large strand in discussion of piracy in the Roman world, the ancient world in particular, but especially Rome, as equating pirates and terrorists. Right. right. As equating this non-state actors, that's the term, right? Non-state actors who are a threat and who are that a state can establish themselves as being against, but they're amorphous enough that they could be anywhere and that you can pass special laws and you can, you know, ask related and allied states to do things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to ask them for because there's this threat that everybody understands as being a true existential threat, that you all have to band together and, you know, you're with mm -hmm. us or you're against us. How do you prove you're not a pirate? By actively and visibly suppressing piracy, because otherwise mm -hmm. we can't tell you're not a pirate. What if you're harboring pirates? Unless you're hanging a certain number of pirates, we can't tell you're not a pirate. You know, how do you prove you're not a terrorist? How do you prove you're not harboring terrorists only by really actively and visibly and explicitly, mm -hmm. you know, falling in line with these states that are requiring you to do things you don't want to do. You can push the analogy too far, but there does seem to be a lot of this um, construction of alliances. And here's where the d discussion really gets touchy, using piracy as an excuse for imperialism. Right. Imperial extension of empire in the late Republic in Rome and previously Athens and Crete and other places and Rhodes 
uh, sorry, Athens and Rhodes in particular, and others did similar things. But mm. to claim that it's only to suppress piracy that you need control of these places that you wouldn't otherwise need it. You can see why that gets brought up as an interesting parallel right. to current and contemporary discussions around terrorism. Right. So. <laughs> By the way, since you mentioned Rhodes, it just suddenly reminded me that, of course, Rhodes has uh, an important is an important step in the development of insurance, naval, uh, maritime insurance. Oh yeah, you you mentioned that in in another in, in the, the average in the videos. average video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, not only are your are your shipments in danger of bad weather, mm -hmm. but potentially pirates. pirates. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, no, and and that's you know that's a major element in, and that's you know one of the reasons for the commercial interests of mm -hmm. Rome. Rome, it was not only imperial, and that's one of the arguments that's going on. It Like, how much was it about imperialism, this whole stress on piracy? How much of it was a genuine desire to open up commercial mm -hmm. opportunities for Romans mm -hmm. um, by making it commercial trade safer? Right. Because it was a genuine threat. Whatever the political persuasions or non of these pirates, it certainly was a real thing mm -hmm. um, that, you know, ships were at absolutely at risk of piracy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I mean, there's, I could talk about pirates in the ancient world a long time, but I think that's quite more than enough, probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, they are, you know, they're a really important element mm -hmm. of uh, an interesting period and they recur. Yeah. You know, you can, we didn't talk, except for in the video, we didn't talk at all about Vikings, but the right. whole <laughs> issue yeah. of, or even pre, pre that other kinds of Germanic raiders and the Roman responses to the Anglo-Saxon pirates, yeah. you know, you can, you can talk about a lot of geopolitical things that have happened mm -hmm. even in the ancient and medieval world before you get on to the, the golden age um, in response to, or as a result of things that have been labeled piracy. Mm -hmm. And, the other element I'll, find, I'll end with is that the other connection to terrorists is one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Mm. One man's pirate is another man's privateer. Right. Or one man's pirate fleet is another man's navy. Right. Right. So who you call in a pirate, yeah. you know, is, is a really tangible connection to the current to construction the current. of yeah. uh, terrorism. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, also thinking of the sort of current ideas about piracy in the intellectual, intellectual property, property yeah. sense. Of course, there are a lot of people who take a, an ideological stand about, you know, things should be freely available. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's there are good arguments about copyright, as mm -hmm. you pointed out in the video, you know, indefinite extension of copyright is a problem. Yeah. So, you know, is it piracy if the copyright is unjust? Yeah. You know, is there such a thing as just piracy? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it it is an ongoing debate in both realms. Mm -hmm. I think that's good enough. All right, then. I think we should stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Avast. <laughs> Avast, me hearties. <laughs> Well, we're stopping there. I'm not going to make any promises now about when the next episode is going to come out because <laughs> I failed last time. I promised we'd be back on the two-week schedule. I just don't know. There's a lot of complicated things coming up in our life. Traveling. A lot of traveling and yeah. Various so, things. So. But we'll do our best. And by the way, if anyone has any topic suggestions, it's not that we're running out particularly. We've always got things we want to talk about. But if there's anything that you'd particularly like us to discuss or in particular anyone you would like us to interview... Or if there's someone who would like to put themselves forward to be interviewed, <laughs> um, we're always interested in that. We'd Indeed. love to hear that kind of feedback. All right. Bye for now. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.